Namaste. I wanted to say a few words about knowledge and ignorance. This is a very tricky subject. Why is that? Because as soon as we create knowledge, we also create ignorance. You see, knowledge is only true within a particular context. Truth is arrived at by elimination of the false, isn't it? So when we create a truth, or when we notice or become aware of a truth, we also create untruth. As soon as we are aware of what is right, we also create what is wrong. As soon as we're aware of what is good, we create what is bad. This is inescapable. Why? Because being in the world is always dualistic. To get beyond duality, one has to go beyond knowledge, beyond truth, beyond right and wrong. This is very deep. Everything that you can say is true within a certain context. Someone else could say is false within a different context. And they would be right, and you would be right. <laughs> it all depends on how you define your context. For example, Dualists are fond of saying the soul is eternal and God is eternal. And within the context of dualism, that's true. But non-dualists also can say there is no soul and there is no God there is only the self, if they're positivist non-dualists. <laughs> or if they're negativist non-dualists, like the Buddhists, they could say only nothingness, only emptiness, only nibbana is true. Everything else is false. You see? It depends on the context. Let me explain that example a little more. It's kind of tricky. In duality, one is fragmented, an individual, a part, a piece, huh? like a, a piece of a shattered pot. The whole would be the pot when it's glued all together. And that's what we call God. So just like the existence of the peace is meaningless without the whole. So the existence of the whole is also meaningless if it's shattered into pieces. So from the point of view of non-duality, the existence of the individual and God and the world, incidentally, seems to be illusion. Now, turning it around the other way, from the point of view of a dualistic person, the understanding of the non-dualistic people that everything is one, and I am everything, and I am God. Huh? In other words, the self is all. Brahman is everything. And I am nothing but Brahman. Therefore, I am the whole. I am the self. To a non-dualist, this appears perfectly reasonable. 
But to a, a dualist, it appears to be complete illusion. So in other words, the two understandings completely contradict one another. But it's only because of what one considers to be the context. The non-dualists say, oh, non-dualism, uh, Advaita, is the only true context, the only true faith, the only real meaning. Huh? And the dualists, like the bhaktas and uh, religionists, say the opposite. No, only dualism is true, <laughs> and everything else is false. So what does this mean? This means that every time we think we have knowledge, we actually only have ignorance. Huh? The theistic person, the dualist, thinks I'm the only one who has the truth. And the Buddhist, huh, the shunyata people, they think only emptiness is the truth. And the Vedic Advaitists say only the self is the truth. And guess what? They're all right. But to be right, what they have done is to put on blinders, to eliminate all the other possible explanations of the truth. And what that means is they're not looking at the whole picture. Just like I recently came to the conclusion that one has to transcend transcendence. Otherwise, if one clings to transcendence, whenever one is in the world, he's resisting, he's fighting, he's uncomfortable, he's stressed, he's tense. Because he's thinking, this is not the truth, this is not reality. But when you're in duality, it is the reality. And you have to agree to that reality <laughs> to operate within it. Otherwise, you become useless. <laughs> but the same is true of non-duality. If you find yourself in a non-dual space and you're clinging to duality, you're going to be in a panic. Oh my God, what happened to everything? One time. <laughs> this is a story from the bad old days. One time I mistakenly took too much LSD. I had taken a pill that I thought was one dose. It was something like 16 full doses. Way more than I wanted to take. Way more than I knew how to handle well, I had to learn real fast. Because what it did was it threw me into a space that was completely blank, empty, black. No senses, no body, and really no mind. And I had to deal with it. After freaking out for a while, <laughs> I finally came to the conclusion, oh well, <laughs> I'm just going to have to create the universe all over again from scratch. And so I got busy. <laughs> you know, you grab a couple of hydrogen atoms and you start making a gas cloud and then that gradually condenses into a, a planet. And, you know, like it's, it's hard. It takes a while. I had got as far as fish. <laughs> I remember making the ribs, you know, <laughs> the fish. <laughs> when I suddenly came out of it, and all of a sudden I had my senses, my body, and the world, and everything again. Because I was completely unprepared for that non-dual experience. It was a freak out. Oh, I know one guy who got dosed, I mean, even worse than that. 
And he was like catatonic for months. And this poor guy had no background in philosophy, no background in meditation at all. So he was a mess. He had to like start over from scratch when he came out of it. But what happens when we go into a space that we're not prepared for is that we tend to deny it. Now, everybody goes into a non-dual space at night when asleep, deep asleep, uh, even beyond dreaming sleep. In deep sleep, there is no senses, no body, no mind, uh, no phenomena, nothing. We all experience this every single night. And if we don't, we go insane. People who are deprived sleep, especially deep sleep, go nuts after about two weeks. So it's something we need, yet we deny it. We say it's not real. Huh? Or I don't remember. Yeah, you remember. You remember getting a good night's sleep. <laughs> because if you didn't get that sleep, you wouldn't be satisfied on waking up. You'd still feel tired, like you need to sleep more. So people who are committed to a context of duality, when they experience non-duality, they deny it. Just like I've been saying for so many years, and people don't get it. People have spiritual experiences all the time, but they don't recognize them. They deny them. They throw them in the trash pile, in the, into the subconscious. And so they become ignorant. See? As soon as we think we have knowledge, oh yeah, this is reality, this is the world, this is my body, this is my senses, this is what I think, this is what I know. Actually, we have blinders on. Actually, we have created ignorance. So, in the esoteric teaching series, I talk about the complete spiritual path beginning from the fall, the fall into materiality, the fall into ignorance and suffering. And then the path, which is the gradual step-by-step -step climb out of it. And this is based on the Buddha's system of Paticca Samuppada. But in order to update it to our modern understanding, I'm using the system from Ramana Maharshi's uh, Upadesha Undiyar, which is the Vedic system of four yogas. That's Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga, and Jnana Yoga. Now, all religious systems and all spiritual methods fall somewhere on that scale. For example, Buddhism is nothing but Raja Yoga. Now, when the Buddha was present 2,600 years ago, everyone who approached him had some background in Vedic knowledge. They already knew about these yogas. They already knew about meditation. They already had some background in Karma Yoga through the temple system, the Brahminical system study of the Vedas. But then, after 500 years or so, Buddhism split from Vedic culture. In fact, they became very antagonistic. And the Vedic connection was lost. And so the people who began to study Buddhism at, at that point had no Vedic background. And so a lot of what they were studying made reference to knowledge they didn't have. And this is still true today. So before you can really get Raja Yoga, you have to have gone through Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. This is why when I began to meditate in a Buddhist way, I got stream entry after six weeks. 
1984. Six weeks. There are people who meditate their whole lives and don't get stream entry. I've met lots of them. <laughs> Poor rascals. They don't know. They have to have a background in Vedic studies, especially karma yoga and bhakti yoga. And without this bhakti yoga, the tendency is to become dry, over-intellectual, heartless, uh, lack of sympathy toward others and even toward oneself. And so without that, the meditation fails. Because ultimately the meditation is personal. The, the apparent impersonality of the Buddha's teaching is only a device. It's a device to clear out the conditioning of the mind. That's all. So the people who are studying Buddhism deny the truth of the Vedas, even though the Buddha's teaching came out of a Vedic background in a Vedic culture. And so they fail. What can I do? I can only tell the truth as far as I know it. But I've studied all these things in their native cultures. I lived in India and studied the Vedas and Bhakti and did lots and lots of karma yoga. I lived in Sri Lanka and I studied the Buddha's original teaching, not the commentaries, not the popular Buddhism, uh, but the sutras. And I, I not only studied them, I practiced them as well. And in three years, I read through all the Tripitaka and I got second, third, and fourth path realizations. Nobody believes it, but I don't care. <laughs> I still got it. Why? Because I had the background. I had the context. I wasn't in denial of the Vedas. I still honored what I had learned and saw it as true, even though on a superficial logical or verbal level, it contradicted what I was learning in the Buddha's teaching. But I never went into denial about it. Therefore, I got the results. So even after fourth path, I still felt incomplete. Something was missing. So I went in search and I went all over India, meeting different teachers, stu uh, studying, uh, different scriptures that I had not read before, staying in different communities, up in the mountains with the Babads and all of this, up in Nepal and all this, all these crazy places. Huh? And finally, I found Ramana Maharshi's. Now, Ramana Maharshi's teaching is a context that embraces all the different methods. So if you're a Christian, no problem. If you're a Muslim, no problem. If you're a Vedic Kali worshiper, no problem. If you're a Krishna devotee, no problem. If you're a yogi, great. If you're a bogey, <laughs> well, you might have to clean up your act a little, but okay. <laughs> if you're a Buddhist, we got that covered. And if you're an Advaitin, cool. Uh, this is the way home. So, to my mind, truth is the context that is the most inclusive. So if, if I'm talking to somebody who is a, a, a sectarian, born-again Christian from the American South, uh, they're only going to accept a, a tiny little fraction of real spiritual knowledge, because that's all they're comfortable with. That's all will fit in their little context. Huh? Everything else is untruth to them. Vedas, bhakti, devotion, all this stuff is out of their world. So they deny it. That means they're ignorant. 
They have blinders on. They can only see what's right in front of their face in their little world. And incidentally, oh, this is a really cool point. This is how science works. Science works by narrowing the context more and more and more until it's so narrow that it's very easy and simple to find repeatable phenomena. See, science only really works in the lab. As soon as you go outside the lab, science is bullshit. <laughs> Why? Because it's such a big context, everything is possible. In the lab, they create what are called controlled conditions, controlled experiments, right? That means narrowing the context. See, and that's why so many scientific papers today cannot be replicated by other researchers. Because the original uh, research was done in an environment that cannot be duplicated. The context was narrowed in a very specific way, and so those results cannot be repeated. So most of science is bullshit. Most of science is tricky creation of a very exclusive context and then observing some unrepeatable phenomena within it. But the same thing happens in spiritual life. Huh? The born-again Christian can't talk to the Vedic devotee. The Vedic devotee can't talk to the Buddhist. The Buddhist can't talk to anybody else. <laughs> They're off in their own little worlds. Each one thinking, I have the only truth. Yeah, and you have the only ignorance too. You don't gain anything by narrowing your context. All you do is increase your ignorance and make yourself a fool. So this is my advice. Go search out the biggest context you can find that validates the truth of all the parts within it. Then even though you're still ignorant, <laughs> but you have reduced the ignorance as much as possible, as far as possible. So when you're in the world, Huh? When you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. When you're in the world, based on duality, operate according to duality. When you're in deep meditation, in nothingness and emptiness, act according to that reality. And when you're in, in deep communion with the self of all, huh? in non-dual consciousness, act in that reality. It's okay. It doesn't, the contradictions don't matter. Contradictions are only artifacts of our forms of expression, our language, our ontology, and ultimately our ignorance. So when you meet someone whose universe is much bigger than yours huh, and includes your little universe, that you have found a mentor. You have found someone who can teach you something. Huh? If you're looking for someone who's just going to confirm your bias, huh? confirmation bias is a huge problem in science, in philosophy, and especially in religion. So if you're just looking for somebody who's going to tell you, yes, you're right, oh yeah, sure, your, your ignorance is perfect, yeah. <laughs> You won't go anywhere. You won't learn anything. You won't make any progress. To really get uh, well mentored, find somebody whose scope is so vast, and yet they understand your little world perfectly, and then ask them to give you the tour. Huh? Hey, show me around. <laughs> I'm going to conclude with a quote. This is from an article on the scientist 
Claude Shannon. If you don't know who he is, he's an Einstein level genius. He developed, or I should say, came up with the concept of the bit. Uh, the smallest unit of information. And of course, now we have this enormous house of digital cards <laughs> built on that concept. And what he said was, making the most of mentorship doesn't just require the confidence to approach someone whose guidance can make a difference in your development. It requires the humility to take that guidance to heart even when it's uncomfortable, challenging, or counterintuitive. Otherwise, what's the point? Accepting real mentorship is an act of humility. The best of it comes when you're actually willing to trust that the mentor sees something you don't. There's a reason, after all, that you sought them out in the first place. Be humble enough to listen. Ong Tat Sat, baby. Ong Harihi Ong.